<laughs> yeah. sound amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Cool. Well, welcome everybody. Um, this is another episode of Talk to Toe, and this uh, podcast is brought to you by a couple of real grad students, as always. <laughs> Science, curiosity, um, and just, you know, discussion on cool topics. So, I'm joined today by a very special guest, Hamsa Gata. <laughs> I'm so welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> it's my first podcast. I know. Well, hopefully we can calm the jitters a little yeah. bit. I know it's always a little bit, I don't know. Yeah, yeah I mean, but it's cool though. I'm excited. Yeah, I mean, we've known each other for, I guess, a couple years now too. Mm-hmm. Um, you were in the biomedical engineering program before I was, mm-hmm. um, but you were originally from Maryland, correct? Yes. Mm-hmm. So I guess let's talk about how you ended up here in California, what that process was like. You went to the University of Maryland. Mm-hmm. Um, what did you study while you were at the University of Maryland? So I, I, so I went to the University of Maryland in Baltimore County, just so no uh, like misconceptions with the College Park campus. I was at Baltimore County. And um, I was actually in a program called Meyerhoff Scholars Program. And they actually are like focused on um, helping essentially like underrepresented minorities like go on into grad school and stuff. And so I had applied and gone into it for undergrad and then basically done research in undergrad. And um, they didn't have like biomedical engineering specifically at um, UMBC, but they had like chemical engineering with the bioengineering track. Like bio yeah. So I did research in a couple labs there, and I was like interested in medical devices and those things. So that's why I wanted to go to grad school for BME. Okay, nice. So I guess when you were doing research in undergrad, like, what was that like? Was it also like part of the program, or was it maybe something like extracurricular? Um, yeah. So I think like the program mainly just encouraged you a lot to like get involved in research. Like they had a lot of the resources that. Right. Would, connect you with professors and like um like internships a lot of internships like uh I did one so one of the reasons why I applied to schools in California because I did an internship at Berkeley one year and I really liked that I didn't like the research at all but I liked <laughs> California and like just the ambiance and like everyone was so nice and chill here so I was like I definitely need to come back here so I'm guessing you grew up in Maryland yeah um what was that experience like? I guess the East Coast is obviously different, but yeah. I grew up in California, so I don't really have yeah. you know, that experience. But <laughs> um, It was, I don't know, I think, so to be honest, I kind of live in like semi the Irvine of Maryland, I would say. Okay. So that was not so much. I think like the demographic was definitely different than um, like SoCal area, but I think I was just super lucky, honestly, growing up, I didn't, um, I think I was, like, very sheltered in a lot of respects, so coming out here, it opened my eyes to a lot of things, um, and, yeah, I don't really have anything bad to say, but the winter sucked, I (laughs) am in a family with only two daughters, so (laughs) it was me and my dad, uh, and... So, but me and my sister are like nine years apart, so... Okay, so that's a pretty big gap. Yeah, so when she was like in college, I was like still in like middle school, elementary school, so like I guess she helped my dad shovel snow for like the first half (laughs) of her life and then I did, so don't miss those things, but... Right, that's kind of the recurring theme I hear from the East Coast, is just snow days. I don't miss... I I miss those, for sure. Yeah. But not the shoveling. Not the shoveling part, yeah. Yeah. Actually, my mom went to Syracuse in New oh, York. Oh, okay. Oh, that's, like, legit. Yeah. It, yeah. But it was also, like, the winters, they were also crazy. Yeah, that's, the, that's yeah. like, legit winter up. Yeah, yeah, it's, like, she was showing me pictures, and, like, you literally just had, like, you know, six feet of snow on top of a car or something. Yeah. It's like, well, I'm not taking a car today. Yeah, and I mean, like, they there, they, like, don't give snow days for, like, just a couple inches, right? That's they Yeah, that's crazy. Which is <laughs> mind-boggling, but yeah, I guess I'm just so used to it, but I can't do it. Nice. So, I guess when you were applying to grad school, mm-hmm. um, were you, like, pretty sure you wanted to do a PhD program, or did you, like, apply to some master's programs and also some PhD programs? Um, so, I guess, like, along with the, the program I was in, in in undergrad, they, like, they definitely helped with that process, too, so the main goal of that was to get you into grad school, so I kind of was pretty focused on that. Okay. Um, I didn't, I just like applied straight to PhD programs and it was, 
an interesting process. I think I applied to a lot of schools. I actually like, didn't get into a lot of them, which wasn't like, obviously it's like disappointing at first, but then you're right. kind of like, okay, this is just how <laughs> life is. You know, you're not going to get into everything. Um, but when I came to visit UC Irvine, I met Rachel Gerlin, who's now graduated and doing amazing things. But uh, meeting her and then meeting the other rest of grad students really what like made me want to come here actually. Um, Got it. Just because I feel like they were really welcoming and the like, like I said, ambiance. I don't know. I'm very like <laughs> that's community true. focused. Yeah, so. that's something I really appreciate about UC Irvine too. Um, <clears throat> even because like, even the faculty are very yeah like yeah yeah sorry oriented. even them too they're yeah. so like relaxed and like mm. you don't feel like you have to like i don't know be on i guess <laughs> does that make sense like yeah. you don't have to like be kind of this formality between you and like the professor yeah, i can tell you that's definitely not the case yeah. you <laughs> <laughs> oh really yeah oh man it's very like it's definitely a different culture i would okay. say yeah <laughs> like, i think some people can do it but i think long term mm -hmm it can wear down on you because like it's all like you have to do the expected thing right right like, yeah. you have to focus on your publications and like your research and like that's it yeah um but yeah so I there's know. no like would you say that a lot of um i would say there's less collaboration okay interesting uh because of that uh, i think because people try to protect their research areas yeah. so there's this weird thing in science you know how like some people like want to protect their research yeah. area so that they get the publications yeah and like, for sure which is like a yeah. weird thing to me because i'm like it's all just going we all need to do it and yeah right it's just going to the general body of science yeah first, but, <laughs> but some people care enough where they have to be like oh no like this is our area of research yeah. and like yeah so i don't know but i guess when you're coming here and you're looking at labs mm -hmm. what was kind of your interest like what in biomedical engineering really piqued your your interest and got you thinking about what you wanted to do yeah um so I think so I did in undergrad I worked kind of on like a medical device that the idea was to go into like a clinical setting so that's what I wanted to do I think like I was really focused on wanting to do something for like limited resource settings devices where like you could be using it like in any you didn't need a lot to like make mm -hmm. it work essentially I just I, ha I still feel like there's a lot of technology that we have in like in academia that is not utilized to its fullest capacity and um, I was like I want to work on something that's like translational that like potentially could be like utilized in the near future I mean I love I definitely like love basic research and I think that's like totally important but I think my interests lie more on the applications that okay so like <clears throat> yeah it's definitely a problem the translation yeah. of the things we find out in research, how do you actually make it viable in a yeah. hospital, for instance? Um, yeah, have you, I guess, like, what is your project now then? I guess, what, how are you trying to address that? Yeah, so I was interested, okay, I guess, like, medical devices, and then I was, like, interested in microfluidics, which kind of, I guess, minimizes or tries to transform, like, assays you do on the bench or things you do in the lab onto, like, a very... Um, autonomous device that you don't have to you just like press the button or put oh, yeah. like a solution in and then like it just takes care of everything so a microfluidic device is for I guess people who are yeah yeah answer, like, <laughs> what is a microfluidic device um most basically I guess what the words are so like micro like very small um, on the micron scale uh, you're dealing with very small amounts of fluid so microliters solutions um, and ideally you kind of almost create a design that so it's on like a I guess it's on like a very it's on a small scale but it could be different platforms so mm -hmm. I specifically actually work on something that's called centrifugal microfluidics so I do, generally people know like the lateral flow um, chip which is kind of right. like this rectangular chip that has like tubes going into it and you inject a solution um, and the design of these chips are supposed to mimic the same things that like you could pipette a solution into a tube and like you know go up and down to mix it and uh, maybe heat it up to do like a, like a DNA amplification assay so all those things are tried to like be mimicked onto this little platform to then the end result being like the same thing you would get in the lab 
Um, and so, what was I saying? What was the, what <laughs> I guess we like, wanted to go into? Yeah, that's so like, what is your device? Oh yeah, okay. like, my, right, my research. So yeah, I work on actually a centrifugal device, which is um, basically utilizes centrifugal forces and it works kind of like a CD. So when you spin it, the fluid um, in your design kind of moves towards the outside. So you build a design from the center to the outside and you do the same thing as you would with that little rectangular chip, but you would do it on like a circular, a circular disc. disc. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so my specific project is actually focused on not specifically like a biomedical application, although it's like kind of related, but I work with an environmental engineering professor um, as well, and she's focused on like water quality. And so the idea of my project is to leverage all these things that we've learned in the biomedical engineering field for like a water quality diagnostic, essentially. I see. Um, and so initially it was geared towards like going into de these developing areas where they only have like minimal sources of, of water, like well water, or, like I guess if they have to go to the river or something kind of like those mm -hmm. where you would just have to, um, you know, maybe take a sample, put it into this device that I'm making, and then it tells you, like, what the level of bacteria in that sample is. Got it. So it's really, like, aimed at ensuring that you can quickly assess how, like, dangerous this, exactly, this yeah. water. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, so does that require electricity, or does that, like, like how is, is it a powered device or anything like that? Yeah, so we made it sort of right now that it can be um, powered by a car battery. So oh, it has okay. like a cigarette lighter Pardon? plug. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's it's like aimed at having a low um, power need and mm -hmm. could be powered by a car. Yeah, yeah that's super interesting because like there's definitely, I don't know if you ever talked to Dr. Tang, but he's also very big on like how do you take the medical stuff that we mm -hmm. have like because we have a lot of things in the hospitals here in America that yeah. work very well. But the thing is that we have an infrastructure to support it, like electricity yeah. and like, you know, in developing countries, like that electrical source is like not as prevalent. Yeah. So like there's a lot of battery powered things, like people have tried solar obviously too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's really cool. So like you're mostly looking at like how can you bring our current technology of like checking those bacteria yeah. into a resource environment or a yeah. low resource environment I should say. Yeah. And I think actually now it's even more like the goal was that but I think we're realizing more and more that it can be used not only for those areas but even like, you know, wastewater treatment plants where they have to be kind of like monitoring their bacteria levels or like mm -hmm. um, even like recreational load, you know, <laughs> like because I think a lot of times people who check the ocean, I don't know actually well, who they are, but like if they monitor the ocean levels, they're not going to be able to, like, they have to shut down the beach, right, and then tell people and then, like, be able to keep monitoring. So, like, we've seen the other uses for the technology, but it's still, like, we have to make it work for in order to be able to use it, so. Okay, so what what is, like, one of the technical challenges that, why you've been doing your research <laughs> you've run into? Oh, my gosh. Um, I guess this is technical. So, I guess... Usually when you're dealing with these microfluidic devices, um, the fabrication of it is very time consuming and um, it's not really practical salute. Like it's not practical for like an industrial level okay, um, I see. device. And so- Is it just cause it's really small or is it like- um, So like, it's, I guess it's not only that it's really small, but the the, the technical process to get to that device is uh, what I feel like is not something that you can really implement in an industrial setting. Like, um, I don't know, like if you're fam familiar with like the lithography process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I feel like that in itself, trying to explain that in itself is like, yeah, takes thing. a long time. Yeah. So what we're trying to do with this is actually um, machine it on a machine called a computer numerical um what is that? computer numerical device or is it like? CN, 
Oh, CNC. Yeah, yeah I can't oh, remember what okay. the last yeah. C is for now. Computer, I don't know what the acronym is either. Because everyone just says CNC. Yeah. So I... <laughs> and that's why I'm like, I should know this, but I can't, know, I can't remember the last word now. Yeah. Um, but basically, it's like a milling engraving into like plastic or whatever material. Okay. So that's what we're trying to do now. But the problem is that there are some features that are basically would be totally easy to do in the, the lithography process, but are not easy to do in the CNC machining process. So honestly, that has been like the, the like biggest technical challenge. I mean, it's not like scientifically a problem, but mm -hmm. to be able to make that and then do right. experiments is just like, why is this a problem? Yeah, because the CNC gives you the speed, but not necessarily like that control. That, yeah, and like the yeah. resolution you want, exactly. Got it. Okay. So um, that's been like, probably the most frustrating thing is just getting reproducible things to be able to test. Mm. Um, yeah, I would have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So I guess now that you're kind of approaching the end of your <laughs> grad career, because you're planning to defend in next year. Is that the plan? Hopefully. I'm going to knock on wood. Don't, don't, take, <laughs> don't like marry me to this state. But yeah, hopefully. Uh, that's what I'm aiming for. Okay. So we'll see. That's exciting. That's that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess like as you're looking towards that, um, are you thinking about moving more to the industry side or more to the academic side? Of it? Yeah, I think. I mean, I think I definitely want to do more industry. Okay. Um I I really want to be like not so much at the bench in the next few years. I'm hoping. I want to be like a liaison between people who are working on the technology in the forefront and like um, like being being a liaison between them and someone who can commercialize it. I feel like I want to get those products <laughs> out there and not just like have it stay in like the university. Like it's okay. great that we think of all these things, but we need to like right. get it out there. So you're, you're really focused on that translation aspect and yeah. like um, you're doing that, that fellowship, mm -hmm. right? Um, what's it called? So it's called, uh, now they changed the group a little bit, it's called Research Translation Group Fellowship. Uh, and essentially, it's like for grad students, actually like we've had some law students in it too. So it kind of like combines a lot of the professional um, degrees. And so it basically gives you a chance to work with the people in the technology transfer to, like office um, at UCI and you get to work at The Cove, which is pretty cool. And they're basically like the people who, you know, if your advisors have inventions, they submit some information to this office and then they evaluate the technology and see whether, you know, there's ability to protect your IP or to maybe license it out. Or if you want to start a company, like they kind of help with all of those transitions mm -hmm. and trying to do that. So as like a fellow in the program, you get to read about those technologies and kind of like you're basically um, in the position to help summarize what the technologies are. So like the technical background that we have as like BMEs is like, I, I didn't like realize it's very valuable. Like we can span a lot of different technologies yeah. and still like understand it. And so it's been exciting because I just like didn't realize how much, how many things that professors are doing and like the <laughs> cool things, like you don't realize because you don't talk to anybody, right? Yeah, it's true. You get kind of hold into your... <laughs> Yeah, and mm -hmm. so it's like, it's been really cool and just like that communication and being able to describe it in like a, like you said, like layman's terms, it's very important <laughs> <laughs> your So, so you, I guess you work with some law students, right? Or... Uh, well, there has been. So the, okay. I guess like in the program, there's us and then there's kind of like our like supervisor manager people and then there's also um like the they're called licensing officers so they're actually i bet most people who have phds and also jds um really? okay. who work in the offices and so they like focus on different so some people will be more geared toward life sciences some people will be geared toward engineering but their backgrounds could be totally different and um, okay pretty interesting yeah that seems really interesting like i guess what have you seen as like as you've seen these like research projects trying to be translated into yeah. the setting like what is the steps that they need to go through i guess and how do those steps 
sometimes not work out. <laughs> yeah, so I think one of the most interesting things I found out was like, I know there's, well, okay, maybe it's just because I just don't didn't know it, but I know that, that there's like a, the want to publish first and like get that information out there. But if you really have an invention that you're, um, you really see as valuable and that can have like a commercial value, you want to be able to like patent it before or like get that process started before you publish. Okay. So I think a lot of professors may not know that and they like end up publishing and then backtrack and try to like patent and it's like it ends up not being as easy as if you were to just try and like Got it. seek out the office right when the idea sparks. Like even if you just have an idea, you can still like fill out the information. There's no you can pretty much do it at any time as the idea is developing. Okay, so it's more important to get that patent process started because does it take a long time? Yes, it takes like so long. There's multiple there's multiple stages. It's like a lot of money. <laughs> so okay. I have no idea how people honestly afford all of that. It's crazy. <laughs> the university covers part of it, right? Yeah. If you're working at the university. Yeah, but even then, so like even once you, you know, submit an application for a uh, to like get a patent approved, they then it goes to these, um, like it's called a patent examiner's office, and they essentially try to find every other piece of, anything that's published basically that can go against your technology. So, and that can happen like a lot of times, like they can go back and forth between like us and them, and like you try to like revamp your application, then it goes back and back and forth, and so like, if you can think about it, that timeline is not like just like it within a few weeks it takes like months yeah so that's interesting yeah which is also kind of hard when you're telling professors who also know that the publication process takes exactly months to yeah do that first yeah. yeah so there's like a first um uh like a first kind of draft essentially that once that gets published you can then um Publish like you can do publications like within your group, so that's kind of like nice. Okay. But you want to get that part done first. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> yeah. So if you ever have an invention, <laughs> just uh, submit it first. And yeah. Then... <laughs> well, it's interesting because like since we do so much uh, computational stuff, like there's still a lot of up in the air on mm -hmm. what is patentable on computational. Yeah, methods. that's very true. I, I'm not like as familiar with that like thing, but I know like software is one of those things where it's like copyright, right? Or like it's like copyright to a certain degree. Yeah. Um, because there was like some weird thing where Oracle was trying to like they're the ones who made Java. Okay. Uh, or like the most used Java. Yeah. Platform, and they were trying to sue a bunch of people because basically everything in the world. Yeah. Like up until maybe the last five years, use some form of Java. Right. So they're trying to like get royalties from all these people who use Java. That's so. But I think that I think they ended up losing that legal battle because I don't really exactly remember what happened to it, but I, I know it happened. Yeah. I, I mean, it's like so hard. Like after a while, it just becomes like common, right? Then yeah. How do you protect it? Because it's like, yeah, because it was like, it's a programming language. Yeah. So it's like, the language itself is there, but then what people do with it is still kind of like their own. Yeah, exactly. Their own like intellectual property, I guess. So yeah, that's a that's a weird one. I don't yeah. really know. <laughs> I don't know either. I'm so. just like some yeah. Some inventions will have like oh this may have like a software component, but mm -hmm. I guess it's just you know <laughs> we figure that out when they deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> hey everyone, hope that you're now aware that we have our podcast up on Spotify, Google Play, and also Apple Podcasts. Additionally, we started a YouTube channel and we'll be slowly improving our video content there, so be sure to head over there to like and subscribe. Now, back to the show. Nice. So I guess the next thing I was ask, gonna ask you um, was when you got involved in Graduate Association of Biomedical Engineering students, like you're focused mostly on outreach, so mm -hmm. that's obviously something you're passionate about. Yeah. Um, maybe like why did you get interested in that to begin with? Did you do that? In your undergrad also or um yeah I think I I don't I would say I did more here than in undergrad but I think I was like definitely interested I like I mean I liked always you know talking to students and getting them excited I thought it was just like a like that nice fun thing to do um but I think as I like 
you know, went through undergrad and now in grad school, I kind of, like, I see what kind of impact it has on students, like, if they, if they just know about it, like, know about any type of science and kind of, like, especially being, um, like, a, a woman in STEM, it's, mm-hmm. like, I think it's encouraging for students. I think that if I saw more, I well, okay, so I think my background of being Indian, there's, like, an already, like, okay, you should go into something STEM. <laughs> so that kind of yeah. wasn't, like, the issue there, but I think if I hadn't had that, I don't know if I would have gone into, like, engineering mm-hmm. without seeing someone else, like, that was, like, me doing the same thing. Um, but, yeah, I just, I feel like everyone should have the opportunity to at least, like, know about it and, you know. Know that it's an option. Yeah, know that it's an option, and I think, like, not everyone has that opportunity, so just being able to say, like, hey, you can do this, and but you don't have to, but it's an option. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, is important and like I think it gives us a chance to just explain our research on a like very basic level and we need more of that honestly I think scientists kind of suck at that so (laughs) yep you know that's what we're trying to work on um I definitely also am a big proponent of communication yeah like clear communication obviously not always the best at that (laughs) but still still learning um I guess, like, when you're talking to friends and family about your research, Mm -hmm. like, what is the general response they Um, give you when you, like, tell them about your research? They think it's very impressive, and I'm like, (laughs) uh, I don't really know about that. (laughs) I guess because I'm just, like, in it, you know, you just don't realize, like, you know, what it really means. And then it kind of inspires you, I think. Like, when you talk to them, you're like, oh, wow, I think... Maybe I'm actually doing something important in there. Yeah, you are. If you will, <laughs> I mean, but when, you know, when you're stuck in the lab and you're just like, oh, I just want this experiment to work and you don't really think about, like, the That's bigger true. picture, it, it, uh, it, it's easily, you can get easily um, disappointed and, like, just be like, why am I doing this? Like, what's the point? And yeah, so, yeah. You do hit a lot of roadblocks yeah. in, in the grad program. <laughs> yeah, and I think, like, everyone, when I, like, when I talk to my family and stuff, they're just like, oh, when are you graduating? When are you doing this? I'm like, eventually when my project works, so I'll <laughs> hopefully leave, but... Yeah, it's always the weirdest one to answer. People are like, oh, like, when are you going to be done? I was like, I two know. to three <laughs> yeah. to four years. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I think that's to just be, like, on our foreheads. Like, don't ask about graduation. Yeah. It's, like, honestly... I mean, I know they're just... They're asking out of, like, mm-hmm. you know, they want us to do something after, but it's, like... Yeah. yeah, I did have, though, like, I went home um, in July, and my parents had, like, this, like, kind of gathering up at our house, and some of the, like, some of my um, parents' friends, they were like, asking me, like, super intense questions about my research, and I was like, I don't know if I'm ready for this. <laughs> <laughs> they were scientists themselves, oh, so they okay. were, like, asking me, and I was like, oh, my God, let me go talk to them over here where they don't know about it. Yeah. So they're just, like, roasting you? Yeah. Almost like your dissertation. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, okay, I'll, I'll send you the invite when it happens. Yeah. Oh, man. What about you? Like, do you, like, how does it... Yeah, I think it's... I try to really avoid telling people that I'm doing... Like, I try to avoid using the word PhD. Mm, or, like... Okay. I just say grad school. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> just because, like, sometimes it's easier not to have to go into explaining everything I do. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But I've gotten pretty good at, like, boiling it down to, like, I'm doing research in cancer and how genetics work in cancer. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, like... That's usually where I leave it at. And if people are more interested, then I'll talk to to them about it. But, um, yeah, I think even with my parents, like, my mom went to grad school. Um, She was chemical engineering. Okay. So, um, but she, like, never really talked about... I think we all just, like, like, suppress our, like... Yeah. (laughs) So I think, yeah, because she came to America and did grad school again, because she did grad school in in China. Oh, wow. And And, then did it again? Yeah, because back then, like, a Chinese degree was, like, basically worthless. Oh, my God. That's, like... In America, so... So she... More power to your mom, though. Yeah. like, so frustrated. Yeah, so she actually didn't finish her doctorate at Syracuse. She, like, went in as a doctor and then, like, got the master's and was like, you know what? I'm not doing this again. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's so, work. like, because yeah. you did it already once. It's like, 
Yeah, so yeah. she <laughs> she I, I did ask her maybe a couple months ago like what her research was and uh-huh. she was like, Oh, it's basically useless. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that must be how all grad students feel. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, oh, I don't want to think about it. It's happened in the past. <laughs> yeah. So even when I talk to my parents, sometimes like it's a little bit difficult because they were both engineers, which is like why I was kind of like expected to do yeah, engineering yeah, too. Sure. Like, I'm sure you yeah. understand that, but their engineering was like way different than what I'm doing now, you know, because my dad was civil, so he was okay. he was more like, you know, well, he started out structural, but now he does traffic engineering. Okay. So a lot of his is like statistics about how do you improve. Yeah, like optimization. Yeah, optimization all that problems and stuff like that. And then my mom, she's like basically just doing chemistry stuff now. Got you. Okay. So. Cool. Yeah. So I don't know. It's definitely interesting. But even like within, like you can even see even within STEM, there's like so much that we just don't. Even there's know. a lot of cross, <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of cross disciplinary stuff, areas that you're just like, wow, I never knew that yeah. existed. But it's interesting. I guess in your time here, what's like been the most surprising thing about grad school that you weren't really expecting? <sighs> the I feel like honestly, like the mental. Um, the mental journey <laughs> sounds really dramatic, but I think like in undergrad, mm-hmm. I so I did chemical, yeah, I told you I did chemical engineering for my undergrad, but I think like I was just so focused on like, um, like in school you're just focused on the assignments, you focus on the tests. Like I didn't feel like I ever had time to just breathe and like take time, and I feel like in grad school it feels like we don't have don't have time but we do like there's a lot of talks you have with yourself and you know like alone yeah and I just don't think I had that in undergrad and I was like whoa like why do I feel like this is impossible for me to like I don't know it's just different right yeah I totally relate to that though it's yeah I just didn't think it was it would be as mentally draining but also equally like exciting and yeah I don't I did not expect the mental part of it or the emotional part of it at all I think I just thought oh okay another school another degree like I can do this um yeah and I I totally understand why like it's hard as like anything so I don't know I commend everyone that's like going through it and yeah well I I definitely understand now too I think it's like you definitely have those days where you're like wow, this is super cool I'm doing. And then you have these days where, like, I don't want to talk to anyone because I don't know what just happened this yeah. week. <laughs> like, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, like, I, yeah, that's why one thing I've tried to do, I think, like, my fourth year was probably, like, the most mentally exhausting for me. And I just, like, tried to, like, find other avenues to be like, okay, this is not the end of the world if I don't, like, you know if this part of my project doesn't happen like I think trying to maybe find other avenues and not focus so much on on school and on that one thing that you're thinking about is like is also something I learned Mm -hmm. like like I said in undergrad I was just so focused and yeah it's also like the pace of undergrad is a little bit different yeah it's like and it's also very clear what you're supposed to do Yes, exactly. There's an end goal. Like, I realized one thing is I need deadlines. <laughs> Grad school is not anything like deadlines. So being accountable for yourself is, like, a huge, I don't know, something you have to learn or something that you yeah. have to just, like, cope with. Um, so, yeah, I think, like, just the mental and it gives you time to, like, learn about yourself a lot. Um, I don't know if you feel similar. I, mean, yeah. I know you're just starting third year but yeah do you feel like I mean yeah definitely I think I've learned what I need to do to keep myself like motivated I think yeah um and also like I do I have like very much appreciated like the like knowing that like you need to be doing this with other people like you can't just do it on your own like that's just not gonna work yeah you know um, because I think there is like kind of this tendency, especially the first year. That's why everyone's like, "Oh, I'm just here again. I'm gonna like do it yeah. myself." But like that's a terrible. Way. Yeah, <laughs> I know. That, no, for hundred percent. Like it's just 
it's impossible. You need you need to like depend on other people and learn from them, and that's that's a really good thing. Now, who's like I guess now that you've kind of gone through most of grad school, like who have been those people for you, and like I guess if you had advice for people who are thinking about grad school or like just starting grad school, what would you say to them? Um, I would say that get involved like I think honestly like being in games and being in other things like that has motivated me to keep going in grad school I think it's just like you need other people that you can vent to you can like do fun things with and like who keep you sane whether that is be people in grad school or people like outside Mm -hmm. just doing stuff um and uh don't forget about your physical and mental health I think that's like like if everything just goes to, sh- to like crap then like what else do we have other than our <laughs> physical and mental health so I think I'm realizing that more and more and I would just say like be excited about your project but know that like this is not the end all be all for like what you're doing like there's stuff beyond like that'll happen after and I know this sounds I don't know why I'm get like this is so emotional <laughs> type of response but yeah, I don't know I think like more than the project itself it gives you it's nice because it gives you a lot of time to learn about yourself but also just don't forget about all those other things because like that'll only fuel how um how much you can put into your project yeah if that makes sense like i feel like you That's can true. be a better producer when you're like taking care of yourself um actually there's a book called i don't know if you've read it um uh seven habits for highly effective people Okay, that sounds vaguely familiar. Yeah, but. it's like a, I mean, I would definitely recommend the book. It's kind of like, basically says like, you need to like focus on on you and like give yourself whatever you need to be a better producer because if you mm-hmm. don't, then you're just going to produce like... Mediocre stuff. Mediocre stuff, <laughs> exactly. Like, yeah. And if people are depending on you and then you produce that, then you're just going to continue like not being your best self and then like producing crap so I don't know I think (laughs) that helped me a lot (laughs) yeah yeah so like how did you uh or how's like your support network been while you've been in grad school like what has that been like how Um, because like I feel like it's definitely important to have people like outside of grad programs so like that's kind of like one part of your support network but then there's like the support network within grad school also so I guess who have those people been and like what have you learned um, from them (laughs) I mean, all you guys in games, for sure. I mean, in grad school, yeah, all, like, people in my lab are great. I think they are, like, um, they're very supportive, and they, like, help you out whenever you need, but, like, like you said, you need people outside, so I feel like games, um, I'm also in, like, a, the Association for Women, of Women, I'm not sure what the <laughs> is. Of science um, and they've been really helpful just to like have a community of like other women um, and actually now we did like a mentorship program and they have like oh, cool. um, basically like, female mentors who are kind of at different stages of their career and it's nice because it's like not a formal setting you know I think sometimes when you have like this mentorship programs it becomes like this yeah. formal thing right where you have to be like I've definitely seen like very well done mentorship programs and just like some very botched yeah mentorship and programs. it's like you don't want to have to be like interviewing with your men- you know it's like it yeah. should be someone you can talk to and that's actually really helped in the sense of just talking out like random things or like asking about career help or just being like I don't know like just everyday things that you mm-hmm. may not be able to talk about with other people um, my family has been super supportive they're in Maryland and I think like it I think it has helped me be much more independent being here and being away from them because in school I only lived half an hour <laughs> okay and uh, yeah they are just like always there which is great and they're very supportive um my boyfriend Neil he's like mm-hmm. amazing I think having someone that he's like still in science stem ish but he's not like in our yeah on research and so like when I talk to him about he, the problems he's always just like you know don't worry about it it's gonna be okay and I'm just like you're right like it's <laughs> gonna be okay 
Yeah. And I think, like, just having someone be like, dude, you're, you'll be fine. Like, this is not the end of the world um, has helped a lot. So one thing is don't isolate yourself. 100%. Yeah, like, for sure. I think, like, having... Um, yeah, I think that's why I like going to Gabe's events so much and I'm a fifth year and I'm still going to all these events because I just like, I really like the community, you know? Um, and I don't want to lose that and I think it'll help after I can be, I can come to alumni events. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Like, I was, I mean, I was talking to Dad uh, in the last podcast about mm-hmm. like, yeah, about talking to the first years and hopefully getting them more yeah. support and involvement in that too because I think that definitely helped. I mean, like, yeah. our year out a lot. Um, and, like, a lot of us are pretty close friends now because of that. And that's a lot to do with games, obviously. Yeah. So. I mean, I think, like, so in my undergrad, um, the program I was in was very heavily, like, community-based. Like, mm. we were, we had to go through this this um, thing our, the summer before my, our freshman year, and it was called Summer Bridge. And it was six weeks of, like, the most intense thing I've ever been through in my life. Like, really? Like, we would it's so like i said it's very family oriented so basically the idea is that if one person uh is like late or one person is like like i don't know i don't want to say misbehave that's a weird word but like (laughs) does something bad then like everyone it affects everyone and everyone gets punished basically (laughs) so it was that mentality of like you have to like communicate you have to get the you know you have to be one family yeah and so I think that's and I like and now all of my friends are like in grad schools are like are finishing up and like we all like still get together when we you know holidays come around and it's just it's so nice that you can just go back to those people and I want the same thing for grad school I want to be able to like Mm -hmm. go out and then come back to you guys and just be like hey what's up like how's everything (laughs) going so I don't know I think that's just stuck with me and I really like value that a lot nice yeah I never do you think that that community aspect is like I think a lot of people are missing that in grad school especially yeah. but also just like even when you're at work sometimes like that's probably why people leave jobs so yeah because it's just like <laughs> it's like the culture right yeah yeah, yeah. It, it is important because if you don't have that you don't really have like a functioning team <laughs> for sure so. I think that's super important like I mean you may not like everyone like you may not like right. everyone in your family but <laughs> right but like um you need to at least have their back and mm-hmm. like just be willing to like stick your head out for them when they need it and they'll probably do do it to you when you need it yeah you know? I, I definitely agree that's like super it's been super nice to have that and like um yeah i mean we don't do that many social events but we try right yeah i mean i think so. it's like it's it's just nice it's like i know it sounds so small but even as small as just like being like hey Chris like can you help me with this coding thing I have a problem like I can just go to you and it wouldn't be a problem but Mm -hmm. I think like I feel like unfortunately not a lot of people get involved enough where they have the ability to do that and then they suffer because they're like oh I can't get this to work and then people will be like have you asked anybody they'll be like no yeah it's just like well (laughs) you know it's kind of your problem because you didn't make an effort to me anybody else mm-hmm. so yeah it's also like important to follow up on that too because i think sometimes like we do ask people in other labs oh hey okay, you know this and this yeah but it's really easy for things to get busy and you just never follow up either yeah exactly um, so i think like knowing that you like have that is one thing but you also need to make sure that you when maintain you, when, that yeah when yeah. you ask that <laughs> ask for that you maintain that and you're like continue that yes exactly but, exactly yeah man <laughs> grad school it's great <laughs> yes like it's a great I, said, I have a lot of opinions <laughs> <laughs> so do you think you're gonna stay on the west coast after graduating or um, would you prefer to go back closer to your family i don't know i think like it's like mixed emotions i feel like it would be awesome to be near my family again mm-hmm. um but i also really like I just, I love California. Like, I, just, I feel like it's going to be really hard for me to move anywhere else. <laughs> Honestly. I just think there's hey, a lot we're, of opportunities. We're glad to have you here. <laughs> <laughs> I think the opportunities and just, like, the, I don't know, 
the culture out here is just there's more focus on things that I value and like I think I wouldn't say this place has turned me into an outdoorsy person but I'm definitely on my way there <laughs> um yeah so, we do have um, that that nice aspect we can go outside no matter yeah. what time here it's, I feel like it's really important like even just um like going for walks like in the winter like is that even the that's not you can't even do that on the east coast you know i think that's important and yeah so what are some of your favorite spots around irvine i guess in like the area orange county um i really like laguna beach i think it's a great spot honestly all i feel like all of my places are like revolved around food <laughs> <laughs> no that's i'm totally on board with that too like food is great <laughs> yeah um no, I think like Costa Mesa has a lot of good food places. Okay. Um, I like UTC is probably like my number one. <laughs> <laughs> That's so sad, but I'm pretty much there like two or three times a week. Okay, what is your like go to? I guess go to at um, Chick Fil A. Chick Fil A. Sure. Okay, yeah. Probably number one. Um, and then number two is Ray's Pizza. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, pretty good too. Yeah. I mean, I know Chick Fil A is everywhere, but it's like I never had it that close to me, like ever. Yeah. And so. Um, yeah, that's true. Actually, growing up, like my, because I grew up in a kind of small town in California, like we didn't really have Chick Fil A for a while. Yeah. Like years. That's crazy. I don't even know. Like I don't even know where the one. Oh, actually, I do. But it's like fifteen minute drive. I'm not gonna drive. I don't know. I don't think I would drive fifteen minutes. <laughs> Maybe now I would. Yeah. Now that you're, you've yeah. been driving around a lot. Right? Yeah. yeah. But um. Yeah, I would say those two are, like, my number one at ETC. Target is, like, <laughs> always in my heart. You can't go to Target and not buy anything. <laughs> so. Yeah, that Target is dangerously convenient. Yeah. but I mean, it doesn't have everything you you need, but yeah. it's enough. It does have that nice little, like, walkout, check, it, check out thing yeah. in the back, too, which is, like, super, super quick. So. Yes, super convenient. Definitely designed for people in <laughs> college. Oh yeah, like, I was like well planned <laughs> when when everyone was coming back. Like, I had never seen it so packed um, when all the undergrads. Were yeah, coming. I just avoided that entire area <laughs> when school started because that was, was like, a good idea. The academic year, I was like, oh, that that's gonna be yeah. a mess. Even now, it's like super packed. Like just in general, UTC. I yeah. liked it when there was. <laughs> yeah, it was nice. <laughs> the undergrads were <room> there. <laughs> Where's uh? I guess, have you done some, like, exploring in L.A.? Um, a little bit. I, I like Santa Monica. Santa okay, Monica yeah. is, like, really nice. Um, honestly, the traffic is what defers me. <laughs> I know L.A. Yeah. would be, like, so cool to just go on, like, a weekly basis, but the traffic is, like, Yeah, it's pretty too rough. Much. Uh, I went to the Getty Museum this oh, summer, yeah. which was really cool. I've never been there before. Mm -hmm. um, That's a great museum. I yeah. went there with my girlfriend, like maybe two weeks ago oh yeah 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 it's really nice yeah it's a great and they also have, like rotating exhibits too yeah so. i went to like um i think it was called like the beast Myst mystical beast okay or something it was pretty interesting yeah i liked it a lot um, it's got a nice little like view of la it's too. so pretty yeah i was like why haven't i come in here before <laughs> <laughs> yeah because like a lot of people don't know like it, it's like right there it's yeah it's kind of like it's right next to the freeway, but it's kind of up on that hill. And yeah. Like, it's in a very random place, but the great views. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I've been there. Um, I think I like San Diego better than L.A. Mm -hmm. Just because, I don't know, I think it's just more chill. <laughs> Not so much traffic. Yeah, L.A. is hectic. Yeah. Very hectic. Yeah. Like... I don't think I would move back there now. <laughs> where so you where? Because I went to I, I went to UCLA. Right. Did you live like where did you live? I now? lived right off campus, which is like right off the four or five near okay. that. Uh, so it's Wilshire exit, which is like just south of the Getty. Oh okay. So actually, like from where I live to the Getty is probably like a 10, 15 minute drive. Oh okay, nice. Um, so yeah, but even then, like I was in college, I didn't really go there that much because. I was just super busy, but yeah, even that area is like massively congested during yeah. pretty I don't much know every how day. People like drive. I don't even know. <laughs> you get 
really assertive in driving, <laughs> but you get really good at it. <laughs> That's con- like good to know, but also concerning. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's kind of like everyone mutually knows these like new set of rules. Yeah, you know, like and they're just like. It is what it is. Yeah, these are the rules. They're not necessarily the laws that you're supposed to follow, but they're the rules of LA driving, right? Oh my god, yeah. So I... like, red light, if you're in the intersection during the red light, you're good as long as you made it there during the yellow. Oh my god. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, people are, people are terrible at intersections, but. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah so. It scares me, honestly. Like I, even like the freeways just, when I like started driving, I was so freaked out because it's just like right so many lanes. Yeah, what was your perspective on like the freeways in California when you got here? It was huge. I, the one thing I really like though, which is kind of weird, is that like you can just see like mountains and you can like see the landscape. Mm-hmm. I guess on the east coast, like most of the east coast, everything is just like wooded. Like on the sides of the roads, it's just like trees. Oh, okay. And so like you're just focused on what's in front of you, which is more trees. But I never thought about that. Yeah. It's like super nice. Like you just, it's I don't know. I value the drive, like the landscape, much more now that I like can see it. Um, but it was scary. I think like yeah, like you said, people are more aggressive, so I wasn't really used to that. So I kind of just stay in the most right lane because <laughs> I'm super slow. <laughs> I'm a very uh, cautious. That's better. Over cautious. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's significantly better. Yeah. yeah. So I tend to stay in that lane. <laughs> yeah. I will say that people don't check their blind spots in Orange County, though. Yeah, they just like, <laughs> like won't even like give a signal and just be like, boom. I'm like, where did you come from? <laughs> it's a little bit concerning. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I think we've talked a lot. And nice. <laughs> yeah, thanks for this your is time. Fun. Yeah, hopefully we can do this again at some point. Maybe once you're out of <laughs> every... give you the out of grad school yeah, perspective just a low down. i mean we i learn a lot from you obviously and like you've been ahead of the journey so like i'm always down to hear what's come <laughs> from people who are like further down the the grad path because yeah. i'm happy to help just yeah. <laughs> if i can give you any advice everything will keep going so don't worry yeah that's um, true yeah i don't want to be that i think as you um when I like first came and I was like talking to like fifth years and sixth years, you're like, they're like, don't go, or like just run. And I'm just like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but I think like I can understand their perspective now, but I don't think the like telling those students if they're kind of already on that track to just go is kind of like the best way to go about it. Yeah. I think it's more just like telling them what you learned and how that can help them in the future. Mm. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, do you have any uh, plugs or <laughs> anything like um, that? Do you do social media at all? Not really, kind of. No, not really. Um, I don't know, Gabe's. Yeah, Gabe's and yeah. Um, I'll put a plug for Association of Women in Science. Um, it's a growing community on campus. Nice. <laughs> uh, and yeah, if you're not part of Gabe's, then be me, join. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so hopefully if there's any first years listening, please come out. Yes. Uh, we have fun things, and we can help you, hopefully. <laughs> yes, we're awesome. Nice. Um, yeah. That's All right. It. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for tuning into this podcast. Make sure to like and subscribe. Talks with Toe is written and produced by Chris Toe. Be sure to like and subscribe to Talks with Toe on Spotify, and also give us that five-star rating on iTunes. Also, be sure to go over to YouTube and subscribe to Talks with Toe. Music is by Purple Planet. You can visit their website at purple-planet.com.